Good morning, church. It is so good to be able to worship in the house of the Lord with you today. Um, before we get started, if you were browsing through your bulletin, you may have noticed that one of the songs we're singing in worship today was a song we sang last week. That is not a mistake. That is intentional. Um, <clears throat> and you will kind of find that we are going to sing some of the songs a little more often. There are a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, statistically, the average churchgoer only shows up two to three times a month, which means by the time we've sung a song like 10 times, they may have only heard it once or twice. But it also helps us up here on the platform to be able to better lead you in worship. It means we're more familiar with the songs that we're playing, which makes it easier to also learn new songs for rehearsal. But most importantly, it helps us as a congregation. Um, it helps us be more, form, more familiar with what we're singing. Um, it helps us not have to rely so much on the words on the screen so that we can really worship from our heart. And it'll just really help us be able to worship more in unity, be able to worship more freely. So you'll kind of see some songs a little more often, and that's okay. It's really intentional, and I just wanted to let you all know that. Go ahead and stand as we begin worshiping. We've got a new song today. It's called um, His Glory and My Good. So let's just sing about how all things are for His glory and our good. I have seen my Father's glory revealed in Jesus Christ. And the more that I behold Him, the more He satisfies. When I gaze upon His beauty, when I see Him as I should, then my eyes are lifted upward for His glory and my good. There is hope in every trial, for I can trust the Lord. He will turn my heart towards Him and help me bear the thorn. So in faith I follow Jesus on the road not understood, for I know to our God, to our God, be the glory, to our God, be praise, He alone, the name above all names, I will boast ever only in the Lord my God, for I know His glory is my good. See the open arms of Jesus. See the open arms of Jesus upon the cross that day. What they understood as weakness deserves my every praise. For the charge that was against me, it was nailed into the wood. For I know that he has saved me for his glory and my good to our God, to our God, be the glory, to our God, be the praise, He alone, the name above all names, I will boast ever only in the Lord my God, for I know His glory is my good. Would I gladly be made nothing that Christ would be made more? Would I seek the only kingdom that far outweighs them all? I will stand before my Father where the faithful saints have stood, and with joy my heart shall praise Him for His glory and my good. 
and with joy my heart shall praise him for his glory and my good to our god be the glory to our god be praised he alone the name above all names i will boast place. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you here together this morning. Father, we seek to bring you glory this morning, to lift up the name that is above all names. Father, to boast only in you today. So Father, as we sing together, as we pray together, as we worship you together, I pray, Lord, that we would fix our eyes upon Jesus this morning, the one who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we would give you all the glory, that we would give you all the praise. Be with us as we worship throughout this morning, as we draw close to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. You may be seated, everybody. It is so good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome to South Garland Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us here this morning. It is good to see your smiling faces here today. It's, it's a fun day here at South Garland Baptist Church. We look forward to the time of Bible study that we've just enjoyed together, getting to be with our classes, getting to open God's word and to learn together. We love this time of worship that we spend here with one another, singing and praying and hearing once again from God's word. And then tonight, we're doing something a little special. We're having our annual grill-off and ice cream contest. This is a time of just pure fellowship, pure fun. And so we'll meet together at 5.30 tonight over in Davis Hall to eat as much food as we can together, meat and ice cream. It'll be a good time. If you are bringing meat tonight, the one request that we have is that you show up closer to 5 o'clock rather than 5.30. That gives us time to get things organized for the various judges who will be giving out prizes to those who make, you know, the best meat and the best ice cream. I will say just as an aside that I have been enlisted as one of the judges for the meats. And so if you really want one of those trophies, I like Barnes and Noble gift cards. Um, and you can just see me, see me after the service, okay? So everybody, it's going to be a lot of fun tonight. Um, again, 5.30 is when it begins. If you're bringing meat, then plan on bringing it here at five o'clock and we will enjoy that time of fellowship together. Speaking of fellowship, we want to begin our time of worship here together with just a moment here for fellowship together. So I invite you to stand to your feet and let's take a moment here to greet and welcome one another.
All right, everybody, I want to invite you to start heading back to your seats, make your way back. And as you do so, I want to invite the kids to come on forward. And Miss Sarah's got a message for y'all. Hey, friends. How are y'all? You got a peppermint? Tell me, okay, tell me something that is something that is a favorite of yours, okay. An LOL. Beef, oh, baseball. Beef, I thought you said beef. Baseball and LOL. What about baseball. you? Baseball. Playing soccer. Playing soccer. Oh, girl. All right, God and Jesus. We have a winner. No, okay. <laughs> Catherine, you have anything that's your favorite? Well, guess what? What if somebody told you that no more baseball, no more, no more LOLs, no more playing soccer, but really I'm using all of these as a metaphor or an example for Coco said her favorite thing was God and Jesus. What if they told you no more God and Jesus? But y'all know that in the Bible times, that happened a lot. That Christians or people that believed would get in trouble. Did you know that? No? You sit down? So, do y'all know when we've talked about this, anybody ever seen a magic show? Have you seen a magic show? Okay, but do we know that magic is not real? That magic, it's, it's a figment of your imagination. It's a trick, right? The only magic that's real are miracles that came from God. That's like we say. The only magic, because there's not real magic, the only magic that's real is our miracles that Jesus performed or that God made possible. So if I told you no more soccer, and if I see you playing soccer, you're going to go to jail. If you hold a baseball or look at a baseball game, you're going to go to jail. Anything that you like, because guess what? You know what they were really saying was, if I see you praying to God or talking to others about God, then you're going to be in big trouble. And isn't that what happened to Jesus in the end, too? And so, you know what? Some of the people who were in charge of the churches would get jealous if they heard people talking about Jesus because they were like, but we're in charge. So why are you talking about someone else? Y'all know what it means to be jealous? Like that attention, like if I was like, oh, these sparkly shoes are so cute and I want them. I'm so jealous that it makes me angry. I can't have them. I'll just take them. You know what jealousy means? Does that you understand that? So people would get upset because they wanted to be the superstar of the show. And so there was some guys that got put in jail. And you know what? They loved Jesus. And does God say that he takes care of us? Does God ever break his promises? No. Come here and sit down with us. So God never breaks his promises. Aubrey, sit down. And so guess what happened in this story? These guys got put in jail. And so then the soldiers and the leaders, they went to go check on them. But really in the nighttime, an angel came. And an angel said, hey, guys. I know that you're sitting here in jail, but you know what I want you to do? I want you to go to the temple, and I want you to go hang out, and I want you to go teach and preach about Jesus and God. And they're like, how are we going to do that? We're in jail. How are they going to do that if they're in jail? I don't know. You don't know? Well, what do you think? They can teach from jail. They can teach from jail, but how do they get to the court? How do they get to the temple? I don't know. You do? The angels can get the keys and unlock. Um, I bet so, because that would be like magic, though, wouldn't it? Or would it be a miracle? So guess what? The soldiers came, and they came to look for those guys, and they were like, oh, and he came running back to his leader, and he said, they're not in there. They're not in jail. And he's like, did you let them out? No. Then another guy said, hey, look, they're over there. They're preaching. They're preaching out in the temple. How'd they get out there? 
because of the angels, because of a miracle. So God says that he'll take care of us. And have y'all heard other stories like that? Have you heard stories where someone was going to get hurt and then they didn't get hurt because Jesus, because God took care of them? Do you know any of those? Can you tell me one? Say it out loud. You better know that one. Daniel in the lion's den. What else? What about those guys? You remember that? What about those three guys that got put in the fire? They didn't burn at all. That's right. Then they came out, and they didn't even smell like smoke. None of that. So they, they probably felt the heat, but they didn't even get burned. So what do we need to do if we need help? Because you know that miracles still happen today, that God always takes care of us. But now, what did Jesus leave behind to take care of us? The Holy Spirit. That's right, the Holy Spirit. And so how do you ask the Holy Spirit to help you? How? Pray? Show me. Let's pray right now. Show me how we ask for help. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for these friends. And Lord, thank you for this church family here. I ask that you help us all to be leaders to the children that are here that will be the next group of leaders. Help us to remember and help us to, to share with others that, that God always takes care of us and God doesn't break his promises. And so we thank you for that promise that you, that you, that you give to us, Lord. Help us to do your will. Help us to, to be like Jesus in everything that we do and everything that we say, Lord. Give us the opportunity to share you with others and to please you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand as we continue worshiping in song. Sing holy, holy, holy.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, Father, thank you for this wonderful and beautiful day you've given us, Father. And Father, for all the people that are here, bless them, Father. And for the ones who are not here, you know the reasons why, and bless them as well, Father. Bless this offering we're about to receive, Father, and let your will be done. And all this I ask in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.
confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found is where you are, and where you songs to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand off all on you and Jesus you're my hope and stay of the party of the, of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during that night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go and stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple. And they, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving to the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. 
We found the jail securely locked with all the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the camp captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin and to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than the human beings. Amen. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you to all those who have led us so well in worship this morning. Just a moment of personal privilege here. Uh, Alicia spoke at the beginning about the importance of, of tightening our repertoire so that we're singing music that we know, so that we're singing praises that we're familiar with, so that we're not having to rely so much on the screens and can truly sing from the heart without distractions. And I, I got a, a little moment there in worship of why that is so important. I sit over here in the kids section. Um, it's, not, it's not official, but look, it might as well be. Um, that This is where all of our youngest disciples in our congregation are, are seated. And when we were singing King of Kings, which is one that we do know pretty well together as a congregation, um, there, was, there was a moment there on one of the choruses where I could make out clear as a bell the voices of all of those kids singing right behind me. And that is a beautiful thing for a family of faith. That's a beautiful thing for a church congregation. And so I'm, I'm thankful for that this morning. Um, I hope that what I'm about to give you is good, but it won't be as good as that was. I can tell you that right now. If you've got your Bible this morning, you've heard the passage. Sophia read it for us a moment ago from Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 17, reading through verse 29. And and while you're getting there, I want to take a moment to talk about, about rules and about the exceptions to rules. Because most rules, even the best known, do have exceptions. So it's me, so I'll start with a, with a baseball example, okay? In baseball, three strikes and you're out. Okay? That's part of the common parlance, even if you're not a baseball fan. You knew that already. Three strikes and you're out. That's an ironclad rule. That's one of the simplest things in sports. Everybody knows that. Three strikes and you're out. Unless, of course, the catcher drops that third strike in which case you, the batter, have the opportunity to run to first base. And if you get there before the catcher picks up that ball and throws it to first, then three strikes and you ain't out. Three strikes and you're sitting pretty on first base. It's an exception to the rule. You've heard the rule, which I am told has softened over the years, but it's still a pretty well-known rule of you can't wear white after Labor Day. That's what they say, right? <laughs> Tell that to a bride who's getting married in November, okay? There are exceptions to these rules. I'll, I'll give, you, give you one more that has its exceptions. In grammar, you know that I comes before E except after C. It's an easy way to learn your spelling, to learn the rules of English spelling. I before E except after C. Unless, of course, the word is neighbor or weird or heist or science or species or society or seas or vain, I could go on and on and on. There is an exception, it seems, to every rule. I bring this up because last week we started what's going to be a three-week series on the relationship that the Christian has with the state, our relationship with our government. And we began last week with sort of your baseline rule, 
your default setting, if you will, as a believer in Jesus, established in places like Romans 13 and exemplified by the early church. This baseline rule that Christians are to submit to the governing authorities, to honor the emperor, to be good citizens, that irrespective of what person or what party is in power, we are called to submit humbly to the governing authorities, to honor the emperor, to be good citizens. And even as I preached that message last week, as I was looking out at your faces, as I was working my way through that passage from Romans 13 and preaching this this baseline rule that scripture sets out for us, I could see three words forming on your brain and in maybe one or two cases on your lips as well. But what about? But what about if looking for the exception, looking for the cases in which we're not supposed to submit to the authorities, and indeed, there is an exception to this rule of submission. There are occasions when believers are not only permitted, but in fact called to draw a line in the sand and say, I cannot step past this point. When authorities directly command the believer to violate God's word, the believer is called to courageous confrontation. And that's what we see in this passage here this morning. Sarah did such a wonderful job explaining it to our kids, laying out what the story tells for us about how the early apostles were told by the religious authorities of their day to stop preaching about Jesus, to stop sharing the gospel in the temple and throughout the city, and how when the apostles failed to do so, they were thrown in prison only to be set free by an angel of the Lord where they went right back to the temple and picked up where they left off, continued preaching the name of Jesus. And in the tradition of Moses clashing with Pharaoh, of Daniel entering Darius's den of lions, of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego refusing to bow before Nebuchadnezzar's golden idol, Peter gives us our summary statement here at the end of our passage. We must obey God rather than human authority. So this morning, what I want to spend my few minutes up here doing together is to take a few minutes to talk about those times when principled courage must overrule humble submission and about what believers must be armed with in such moments. We begin with what is most evident here in this passage. If we are to stand up to the authorities when we are commanded to violate God's word, we must have a strength of conviction a strength of conviction. It occurs to me that in the numerous examples of civil disobedience found in the Bible, that every time that someone rebelled against the governing authorities in God's name, that they had a good reason to utterly despise whatever governing authority they were rebelling against and standing up to. So using those examples I mentioned just a a moment ago, Moses and Pharaoh. You think about Moses's background here. He had been raised in the Egyptian palace, but he never rejected his Hebrew heritage. He knew who his people were despite where he had been raised. And we see that most evidently when he saw a fellow Hebrew, a slave, being mistreated by his slaver, and Moses murdered the man. If there was ever any doubt from watching the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt who Mo- whose side Moses was on, surely that was where it got put to bed, okay? Moses had good reason to stare at this Pharaoh who God had told him to stand before 
and for Moses to despise all that Egypt stood for, all that this king of Egypt stood for, to hate the man and the nation. You think about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were exiles in Babylon when they stood against their kings. The empire of Babylon had come in to Jerusalem like a wrecking ball, had laid siege to the city, had destroyed the temple, and had carried off God's people into exile, had taken them from the only home they'd ever known, the home that God had given to them, and sent them to this faraway land. Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had every reason to despise the Babylonians, to hate these captors of theirs. And as for Peter, here in our passage here this morning, for Peter and the other apostles, they're standing before the religious officials of their day, the Jewish religious officials, some of the very same ones who had plotted against Jesus and turned him over to the Romans, had met in secret had ultimately said, give us Barabbas instead of Jesus. So the heroes of these stories, they they have good reason, good context, good background to just hate these governing officials that they're standing up to. And yet what you'll notice in all of these stories is that none of that background comes up when it's time for the moment of truth. That all seems to simply be in the background. It never rises to the surface because the truth is they don't rebel because they dislike that authority. They don't rebel because they've got a grudge or because they've got personal beef with the ruler. They do it because the authority has commanded them to violate God's word, to ignore God's instruction, to bow to an idol, to stop sharing the gospel. And when that command is given, that is where they say this cannot stand. Because it's then and only then that respectability gives way to rebellion. They are armed with a strength of conviction because it's not about them. It's about the God they serve. It's not about their grievances. It's about their God. I'm reminded of a more modern example of this kind of civil disobedience of Martin Luther King and the other leaders of the civil rights movement. When you look at what those leaders were facing day in and day out, living and working in the American South, the truth is that they had plenty of reason to be personally unhappy, personally uncomfortable. They had plenty of reason for their grievance. Everybody in their situation was unhappy and understandably so. But when it came time to lead the movement, Dr. King took a different approach than others had before him. See, there were some who'd come before him who had lacked the courage to stand up, who had said, this is simply our lot in life. There's nothing we can do. The best we can hope for is incremental change over the period of decades. There were still others who lacked spiritual discipline, who said that the only way to earn their rights was to answer violence with violence, to set set aside the commands of Scripture and take matters into their own hands. But Dr. King had the strength of conviction to say, this is wrong, not just for me. This is wrong, not just for my family, not just for my neighbors. This is wrong in the eyes of God. Dr. King had the strength of conviction to say that this is not about what I will gain. It is about what is right. It's not about personal privilege. It is about justice. Because you see, for Christians, 
there are a million times, sometimes a million times a day, when you will look at the government and say, that's not how I would do things. When you look at the way that things are handled at a city or a state or a federal level and say, if I were in charge, we would do things a little bit differently. That's gonna happen, okay? I'm sure it does already. And the good news is that there's a million ways in a democracy to make your voice heard. You get to vote come November. You get to call your representative anytime that you want. You get to protest. You get to fundraise. You can run for office. You've got lots of different avenues to voice your displeasure. But the time for outright civil disobedience of what we, the kind that we see here, that comes when the government demands that you do something that violates God's word or forbids you from doing something God's word commands you to do. And it's then, it is then that you need the strength of conviction to say, I must obey God rather than men. I must obey God rather than than men. And crucially, your conviction must extend not only to your end, but also to your means, to the way in which you respond. And this is where I'm going to lose some of you. I'll warn you ahead of time. This is where I'm going to lose some of you, because this is the part that nobody in 21st century American Christianity wants to hear. If you're going to stand up, stand up for Jesus, then you must also be prepared to get struck down for him too. Because not only must you carry a strength of conviction, but also an acceptance of suffering the stories that that Sarah cited and that I've cited, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You know, part of the reason why those stories are so popular in children's Sunday school classes, in children's storybook Bibles, why they're some of the stories that we, we teach our kids even at a very young age. Part of the reason is because they have happy endings. They're stories of biblical heroes who did the right thing and were rewarded for doing the right thing. You've got the structure of they stand up for what is right, they face severe punishment, but don't worry, they don't get hurt. They not only survive, they thrive at the end of their stories. But here's a dirty little secret, everybody. They didn't know how their stories were gonna end. They didn't have Daniel chapter three to flip through, Daniel chapter six to skip to the end and get a spoiler on what was gonna happen with those lions in that den. They didn't know if they were gonna be rescued. They didn't know if they were gonna be delivered. In fact, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, as they prepared to enter that flaming furnace that Nebuchadnezzar had set before them, they said these words, "'O Nebuchadnezzar, "'we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter.'" If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, well then let him deliver us. But if not, well then be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. They were prepared to answer the consequences of their holy action, to receive suffering for the sake of their faith. In Moses' story, when he stands before Pharaoh and says, let my people go, things get worse before they get better. In Daniel's story, he spends a full night with those lions in that den before he emerges unscathed. In Peter's story here, guess what? He spends a night in jail. And oh, by the way, in Jesus' story, 
Before you get to Easter, he has to die on a cross. All of these, they were ready to accept the consequences of their disobedience to government in the name of their obedience to God. They didn't expect to skate through unharmed. One of the most famous saints of the last century, lowercase s there, is a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You've probably heard that name before. He was a German pastor and theologian who came to the United States in the 20s to study, received his doctoral degree, began preaching and teaching in seminary. And then in 1931, he returned to Germany. If that date set off some alarm bells for you, it should have. 1931 wasn't a great time to return to Germany. But he felt a calling to do so. He could see his nation turning and wanted to be there to provide spiritual leadership. And so in 1933, after the Nazis had taken over the nation, and not only the nation, but the national church as well, Bonhoeffer, along with others, founded what became called the Confessing Church, one that was not tied to the Nazi state, one that was free to proclaim the gospel. And for years and years and years, in secret as well as in public, he worked against and preached against the Nazi government that ruled his nation. Because of his actions, Bonhoeffer has become lauded for his bravery. I mean, anybody who stands against the Nazis is a good guy. We all know that. Anybody who stands against fascism, we're, we're on board, right? But here's the part we need to remember about Bonhoeffer's story. In 1943, he was arrested. And in 1945, he died in a concentration camp. He knew when he was preaching against the Nazis that his story might not have a happy ending. He knew that it might end even in his martyrdom. One of the most insidious elements of modern Christianity is this assumption we have that if you are doing God's will, he will keep you comfortable. That as long as you're in line with what the Father has laid before you, nobody gets hurt. But the truth is, I can think of few things that make less sense in light of the cross of Jesus Christ. What the Apostle Paul told us in Philippians 1.29 is that he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. And Paul knew of what he spoke, by the way. He wrote that verse from prison. There are plenty of false prophets today who will tell you to speak boldly for the Lord, to stand up for Jesus, but who are nowhere to be found when it's time to face the music. But part of what principled, faithful civil disobedience includes is an acceptance of the ministry of suffering. You need strength of conviction. You need an acceptance that it may lead to suffering. And there's one more thing you need that the apostles had here. You need an eternal perspective. See, it doesn't even seem like it was a difficult decision for these apostles to defy the religious authorities and to continue preaching the word. It doesn't seem like they struggled with it at all. An angel set them free from the jail and right back they went, picked up right where they left off. It doesn't seem like they had a debate beforehand about, is this the wisest move? Is this the safest move? Is this the shrewdest move? I, I don't see any conversation like that here. There's no evidence that they struggled with this at all. They went right back to it. Because they were a lot less concerned about their own skins than they were about the souls of those to whom they were preaching. 
They were far less worried about what would happen to them than what would happen to others if the gospel was not preached. We need that same kind of eternal perspective today to keep our eyes on the prize, a prize which is not found on this earth. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep before us what it is we're working towards. It's so easy in our day and time to make current events, to make the political winds apocalyptic, to assume that this is the most important issue we'll ever see, the most important election we'll ever face, to say that nothing matters more to this, more than this. But I've got something I want to tell you, church family, something that may just blow your mind. The Lord our God cares more about a baptism in this church than about an election come November. The Lord our God cares more about one soul who comes to Jesus than about the votes of 160 million Americans. Cares more about the eternal salvation that we preach and proclaim every Sunday than about whatever is going to come in November. So we as believers are called to that eternal perspective to remember, remember what matters the most. To remember that, that sure, elections matter. Sure, politics matter. Sure, current events matter. They affect our daily lives. They affect our tomorrow and our next week. But we're called to a bigger perspective than tomorrow and next week. We're called to something greater and higher and bigger. And so, I want you to know something. There may come times where you are faced with a decision like Peter and the apostles faced here, where you are told by someone in a position of authority to stand for something that stands against the word of God, where you are called to say something, to believe something that Scripture will not allow you to say or to believe. That moment may come where you must say, I cannot. In that moment, you'll need a strength of conviction to say along with the apostles, I must obey God rather than men. You'll need an acceptance of suffering. You'll need to understand that doing so could bring consequences. You can't expect to just get off scot-free. But most of all, you need to remember who and what matters the most. Not one nation, not the kingdoms of this world, but the kingdom of God. And so let us pray together as we prepare to worship that God together. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are the God who sent your very son to this world, not as an earthly king, but as a carpenter's boy. That you sent him not to take up an earthly throne, but to call people to repentance. That you came as a savior not of nations, but of people. And so, Father, may we keep that front and center. May we be reminded of that day after day after day. May our eyes be fixed not on this world, but on heaven. May our priority not be an upcoming election, but an upcoming opportunity to evangelize. May we be citizens of this nation, yes, but first and foremost, citizens of your kingdom. Father God, when the time comes for courage 
may your Holy Spirit fill us with that courage. When the time comes for humility, may you fill us with that humility also. May we obey you rather than any earthly authority. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Our worship will continue. We'll sing to the one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you need a moment of prayer here this morning, if you need to come talk to the pastor, I'll be right down here at the front. Tap me on the shoulder and let's talk and let's pray. For the rest of us, let's stand together and let's worship. Norman's empty praise, the mine inheritance, now and always, now and the only first in my heart, I can you are.
Amen. Thank you for a wonderful morning of worship here together. I'll remind you that we'll gather again tonight for fun and fellowship, 5.30 over in Davis Hall for the grill off. It's going to be a wonderful time together, and I hope that you'll join us for that. So as we depart this place together, may the God of hope, may the God of peace go with you. May he guide you. May he give you strength. Go in peace. I did